Hello, I'm uh, Terry David Mulligan, and I want to invite you to the uh, TDM YouTube channel. This is a video interview that we're presenting from Carl Newman, A.C. Newman, one of the founders and uh, principal songwriters of The New Pornographers. They have just released their latest album called Continue as a Guest. Almost all of the tunes were conceived and in part created uh, through the COVID uh, crisis and the lockdown. Um, and the songs represent it really, really light. Pontius Pilate's Home Movies, Cat and Mouse with a Light Last and Beautiful, Continue as a Guest, the title track, and many more. Um, they will be touring for most of the year. I know they're going to play uh, in Toronto in May, and they don't get back to Vancouver where they started this journey in from 1997. They don't get back until November at the Commodore Ballroom here in Vancouver. In the meantime, you have lots of music to enjoy from the new pornographers. Here's our conversation with A.C. Newman, Carl Newman. Uh, I'm Terry David Mulligan, and this is uh, Mulligan Stew on CKUA Radio and the Mulligan Stew podcast and the Terry David Mulligan YouTube channel. It's all social media, well, except for the broadcast part, which is one of the things that uh, Carl Newman and I are going to talk about. A.C. Newman is on the on the camera, uh, on the microphone. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a while. Yeah. Just been hanging out. Just, I just can hanging out while the world falls apart. Exactly. I, I can remember distinctly uh, the last time I saw you in Vancouver, for example, uh, was in a, a screening room, somebody's screening room, and you were looking at your latest video, but the whole band was there. Everybody was watching it like it was an important screening, and I got lucky enough to be invited. I wonder when when that was. How long ago? I have was no that? idea, but I was very most yeah. impressed that the band showed up to watch the the video and make sure it was right. Um, we must have uh, we must have had nothing else to do. Did you? Uh, I know that uh, as you as you well know, the whole COVID lockdown affected everyone. Specifically, the two people that I keep in touch with winemakers because the vines keep growing and music mm -hmm. makers, songwriters and music makers because the one thing you could do in lockdown was create right if you cared to uh yeah even, even found finds ways to record um did you see it as a how long did it take to actually formulate go wait a minute we can do some stuff here oh i mean i started doing it almost immediately um like our tour, our tour for the last record literally ended like a few days before lockdown. Like we were doing an Australia and New Zealand tour. And I think we got back like March 9th or March 8th. It was, it was within a two or three days of everything just shutting down. And at the time, I think I'd been away for like five or six weeks. Yeah. So I thought, sure. I can handle I can handle being at home for a while. I don't want to go anywhere. Uh, and then, of course, it, it kind of went over. It went over the edge, but I felt very lucky because yeah, I mean, we live in Woodstock, New York, and we have a few acres. You know, like it's a nice place to hang out. I have my studio here, so I could, I could write and record. There was, like, even with everything going on, there was there was nothing in my way. I mean, I could have, I could have had a record finished in two months if I'd really wanted to, but it takes, it takes a lot longer than that for me. The luxury of time. Yeah. You can't, uh, put, you can't put a value on it. I did have that. Um, and, and it, I found that just, just going in my studio and working was kind of therapeutic. Like I didn't, I didn't care if I finished anything. I, 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 like I was just happy to be sitting there with like 30 unfinished songs. I just thought I'll, I'll go in tomorrow and I'll do some more work. And yeah, I, after a while I had to force myself like, okay, you can't keep doing this forever. You have to, you have to cut off a slice off 40 minutes or so of music and decide what you're going to finish. Um, and I'm still, I'm still here trying to finish all the music that I started during uh, COVID. It was just, uh, which is a good problem to have, I guess. Just did trying to keep to, up. Did you have to convince your bandmates to come along for the ride? Well, I mean, all I all I had to do was like send them things. Okay. You know, everybody everybody's got a studio at home, so yeah. 
I would, I would send them tracks that here's what I'm working on. And, you know, Todd would send me some guitar stuff or John would send me some keyboard based stuff or Catherine would send me keyboard stuff. And it, um, it wasn't that far removed from the way we've always worked because we've always been a kind of long distance band. So I think for other bands, it was crazy trying to work long distance, but it's always been, it's always been how we've worked. The weirdest part of it all was that through the years, Nico has always been the most difficult person to nail down to get anything, but she lives about five hours from me. Yeah. So during and during the COVID, that was almost like that was almost like being next door. So <laughs> and she was in she was in she was in our pod, you know, she was in our pod. So I'd say, hey, will you do some vocals? I'll drive up to you or or, you know, maybe she'd want to drive down here just because exactly. you just wanted to do something. It, you were happy just to go anywhere. Um, so that that part was weird. I, I ended up seeing a lot more of Nico than I've ever seen Nico before, just because. You know, we were, you know, we we let each other into our little pods. Very nice. Um, I, I, if I remember correctly, uh, the first artist that I ever, a songwriter I ever heard uh, talk, use the phrase um, found material. Uh, and, and then I realized after I interviewed his grandfather, who was doing some sort of art installation in Vancouver, his grandfather worked from found materials, like stuff he picked up. Just yeah. stuff, right? And so... It spilled over into Beck's uh, songwriting. He found found material. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you kind of work in that genre as well. You you don't throw anything away. You hold on to the lyrics. You you have notes here. You have tapes. D did you did you go back to those banks? Yeah, de definitely. Um, I think I've I've always done that. Like um, you know, like. Like our, our song, Bleeding Heart Show, which is one of our most popular songs, yeah. it came out on our record in 2005. But the big ending, the big Hala ending of that was from like 1999. It was actually one of the first things <laughs> I ever wrote for the pornographers. I just thought it's a cool, I thought it's a cool big hook that needs a song. So, um, if, so if, we, so if, we, if, we, if we can't, if we can't uh, find our Zoom links, how do you find music? Where, uh, where's it correlated? Well, it's, I mean, it's all, well, you know, it used to be in a notebook. Now it's on a, now it's on a hard drive. Um, like, like, I mean, a good example of it is uh, the first song on this record, Really, Really Light. Yes. Um, I found, I found a song that Dan Behar recorded with us for our Brill Bruisers record from 2014. And it never came together. It just, it just didn't work. And Dan said, I'll just scrap it. But periodically when I'm just looking through old stuff um I I found this song and I thought well I just really like the chorus I thought it was a great chorus so I thought I'm just gonna I'm gonna take it I'm gonna take if Dan doesn't want to if Dan doesn't want to finish this and he doesn't want to release it I'm just gonna take it and use it for parts and um I just wrote a new song around it which was well it was a really fun exercise because um you know when you've been writing songs for a long time you're trying to find some new way you know, even if you arrive in the same place in the end, you're trying you're trying to find some new way to get there. So that felt fun. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna start with somebody else's chorus, and I'm gonna write I'm gonna write around it. I I like your comment. It's, I'll share it with the audience. I'm striving for a little Jeff Lynn era Tom Petty kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's got the jangle to it, but it's a great song. Yeah, I I mean I think that's always a. I mean I think so many people have loved that sound <laughs> that um. You know that that perfect robotic uh, acoustic, you know, and then that that I, I think he 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 just he just nailed something nailed something kind of eternal there that I think we always come back to, you know. So. I know you want Carl. I know you wanted to comment on uh, on social media, which has taken over all of our lives, mm -hmm. and had a huge flourish, uh, a really dark side during lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but did you get to say what you want? Well, for example, Pontius Pilate's uh, home movies, which is a great visual in itself. Mm -hmm. Did you get to say what you wanted to say about how social media reflects uh, uh, affected you and people around you? Well, I think I. I mean, I guess. I mean, I think on. I was I was being a little conceptual on that song. I, I was thinking of like the idea of the medium is the message. 
you know, and if I if I wanted to communicate because I wanted to communicate just the disjointed way we take in information on social media, the way that things that are really dark and tragic are always juxtaposed with something really light and funny, you know, like it's this constant stream of information that that kind of makes no sense. It's just it's, it's dark and light and dark and light and happy and sad and angry and happy and and so I thought I wanted to write a song that communicated that, but was was in a, using a similar method where like it's a lot of disjointed lines, where like all like all the lines in that song I was trying to say the same thing, but I was I also wanted to <laughs> feel like just a list of like like a, like a kind of bon moat. What is that bon moat? Just just like. A, uh, some kind of catchy phrase followed with another catchy phrase followed with another it, catchy it phrase. It was like a jigsaw puzzle, but at some point you had to focus, you had to force in a couple of squares in round holes or something. You just had to make it work flow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it was, fun. it's always, it's always fun to like try and write something with a lot of lyrics because it's a, uh, you know, you have to play. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have to, you have to play around with uh, words and melodies and, you know, in creative ways. So, and I was trying to figure out what Pontius Pilate would show as a home movie. Well, um, yeah, I, it, but I think it's obvious. I know you do. You <laughs> think it's a crucifixion. It's it's his high yeah. watermark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Summer movie. And 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 I think and I guess that was the main, <laughs> you know, the, the 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 main metaphor that you know where, like tragedy. I mean. Obviously, it, it's no new thing to say like tragedy has become entertainment, you know, like we watch wars like TV shows and we've been doing it for like 25 years, you know. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the new pornographer's new album, which they're about to uh, tour behind, released on the 31st. Um, AC Newman uh, is joining us. Uh, I, I have it as a night studio. Am I right there? What's that? Night studio album. No, yeah, not yeah, it is. It's crazy. Um, I, I want to ask you about cat and mouse with a light. Um, there's something in there. What is it? Uh, I made a note here. Almost, uh, it's about relationships. It's about reevaluation. Uh, but yeah, you, you reference um, uh, a, a a Dylan style of uh, of writing in that he. He'll write about a whole bunch of things, but at the core is one thought, one line. Was, yeah. Was there one track in particular you were thinking about? Because I thought of, I immediately thought of Forever Young. Uh, and then I thought about all the other songs. There were lots. Um, what? You mean for, for Cat and Mouse with the Light? Yeah. Hmm, yeah, I mean, just, I, mean just I do. That, 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 it is a kind of songwriting that, like, I hate to call it formulaic. <laughs> but because formulaic has a lot of ne negative connotations, but you know a lot of great songwriters, including Dylan, they use their songs are like very little. They're little formulas, like like where have you been, my blue-eyed son? I've been to here. I've been to here. I've been to here. A hard rain's gonna fall. Where have you been? I've been to here. You know, like it, it follows a formula. So I thought, you know, I want I want to try and write a few, um, you know, formula songs. And I also liked how Dylan would. Like in I Want You, you don't know I Want You as a love song until you get to the chorus, you know? Like he, he, he says, I want you, I want you so bad. And then you realize, oh, it must be a love song. And then you go back to the lyrics that make no sense in the verse. So and, uh, I've, I've always, I mean, I've always, I thought that was a good model. And did Last and Beautiful get written at the same time as uh, Cat and Mouse? Yeah, that, um, very similar. Last and Beautiful is, definitely got that what I, that formula thing I was talking about because it, it has that I was gonna go to blah blah I was gonna go to blah blah I was gonna go blah blah but I don't want to go by myself I was gonna you know it's just it's a list of things that I was thinking of doing but then I said I don't want to go by myself so to me it was to me it was fun just to write you know like it would to me it was kind of experimental to write in a way that's not at all experimental to write in a way that's a lot more standard that I write in a way that most writers write. Uh, Carl, I love the I love the line, and I'm glad you, sh you highlighted it. My crowning mistake in the arc of my dive, the last second look down. Having been a diver, I understand that one. That one. <laughs> uh, it, it's um, 
uh, a leap of faith. Yes, right. Yes, but a great tune. I love that. I love that one. Oh, thank you. Uh, the title track, "Continue as a Guest." Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I wrote down your place in the mess. I mean, you were talking about the the mess, but your is a very is a personal statement that you're making there. Well, it is because it's your songwriting. Um, yeah, I think. Well, you know, I think every throughout my life, I feel like I've always, you know, when you're living in a city, sometimes your life is stressful. I think a ton of people get that feeling like, you know, they just want to move out in the middle of nowhere. You know, you, you, you just want you just want to move out somewhere and have a have a simple life. And um, and I, in the middle of the pandemic, I looked around me and I thought, well, you've kind of done that. You know, you're you're living you're living on your acreage out here in Woodstock and you know, you've got your little getaway. Um, you know, and, and I thought to myself, like maybe, and maybe that, and maybe that's what I want. And, and I felt, and it made me feel very separate. It made me feel separate in, in a very obvious way because we were all very isolated at the time. But you, you start asking yourself, like, how much do I want to be part of this culture? <laughs> not like you 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 look or you look around you and the, the world was in a an uglier place back then than it is now just like in terms of illness and politics and um the the idea one one day when i just clicked on continue as a guest when i was buying something it, it suddenly took on a different it suddenly took on a different meaning and i thought yeah maybe maybe i just want to continue as a guest you know and and it, it also made me think about playing music and being in the music industry like kind of like I want to I want to keep playing music but I don't want to necessarily be part of any you know I don't really want to be part of the industry the industry the music industry being this like amorphous monster there are lots yes, of cool yes. people that yes, yes like there are lots of cool people like our managers are great our label merge is great everybody at our labels have always been cool our booking agent but there's this faceless monster <laughs> that that somehow guides the guiding hand of the whole thing. To, to quote Miles Goodwin, April Wine, rock and roll is a vicious game. Yes. Yes. It is. Rock and and dark. Just a second. <laughs> and, and I haven't figured it out yet. That's that's uh, what the whole song that's what the whole song's about. I still haven't go. figured it out. Asking yourself questions. Um, the music business. Um when you started the new pornographers and yeah. you had you had all those dreams. And and it started to move forward, and then really started to move forward, and then really became a thing. Mm -hmm. um, how long did you think uh, the audience, which is can be incredibly fickle, would uh, would would listen and accept and 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 be um, be enlightened by what you were doing? How long did you think your shelf life was? I don't know. You know, I was always looking over my shoulder. Um... I remember I remember delivering the second record to Matador Records and thinking like I wouldn't have been shocked if they rejected it. Like I like a, I thought maybe we'll be one of those bands that has one record cuz there are bands like that. They yeah. they have one record that everybody likes but then, you know, they nobody hears from them again like get the knack, you know? Um and so I thought maybe that's us. And um, but it it wasn't the case. Um I don't know. I've I've always been a little disbelieving, a little disbelieving about the whole thing. Um, like even like even when we were at the height, like at the height of our popularity, when it felt like I was just making more money than I ever thought I was capable of making. Like I even then I was still felt like, you know, I still felt I felt like is this all going to end? Is this going to end next year? Um, it's it's a hard thing to explain to people where like um you don't know when it's all going to stop like like if if one day all royalty checks just stop coming like there's nothing you can do about it you know like there's no one to go to you know like in in a way you're just it's kind of it's kind of a crapshoot it's kind of a bingo game you're just kind of taking what's given to you uh you know and I don't I don't think I deserve it um, I'm I'm glad to get it, you know. Grateful. I also think I, you... I also think why not me? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, why not me? That's right. Mm -hmm. But you're grateful. 
And are you grateful yeah. when uh, uh, the inner conversation you have with your songwriter, you, uh, and and the inspiration all of a sudden shows up like a like your own home movie. Um, you get to trust that when that slows down, when that doesn't work anymore, then you got a problem. Yeah, I mean, I hope that's the case because like, I I don't really see that part slowing down, okay. and it's and it's not because I have an incredible work ethic. I think it's it's almost pathological. I think, like, remember I was I was saying early that I would go into the studio and just work as almost as therapy, and I didn't care if I finished sure. anything. Sure. I think I'm always like that, and so I think I'm always I'm always just kind of working, and. Yeah, it, I think it's it's very much a kind of therapy, and it the great thing about it it's a kind of therapy that I can sell at the end, and hope ho hopefully hopefully at the end of my therapy sessions I've I've made something that I can listen to and other people can listen to. Um, I mean, yeah, but I'll, I, I, mean, I, I always we, like I, I sorry go if we if we had talked at the, when we last saw each other uh, at that the video screening. If I had uh, if I had said you realize you're going to make nine albums, studio albums, mm -hmm. that would have been a, a stretch for both of us because because I just don't I don't have a lot of faith in in people's belief in in, in artists to stay with them because there's so many other attractions, so many other flashy things going by. Um, uh, yeah, you've done well and you continue to do well. Yeah, it's a I mean the the, the industry has changed. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just happy to be here. It feels like, at this point, success is just being able to continue. Yeah. Like, like nobody's nobody's tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, just go get a day job because you'll make more money doing that. You know, which is usually, I think, is usually how it happens. You know, like you have to you have to make some money. So I'm still, you know, I'm not I'm not as flush as I once was just because the industry has changed and also we're a band that's been around for like 20 years now uh but it's yeah it's a uh, it's it's nice to be able to make music and i i'm glad people have stuck around i'm i'm glad people still want to hear what what we want to do that cuz cuz when we started i it's hard to it's hard to talk about it now but i had no delusions. I had literally zero delusions that we were going to succeed. I did not think our record was going to sell. I didn't even know we were going to make a second record. Um, we just, we just did, we just did made a record and, and things kind of took off on their own. So we're doing this interview after the album has been released. Um, or no, actually we're doing this interview just before the, the literally the day before the album yeah that's right it's tomorrow what are your thoughts the day before you're 24 hours out from the release it's like your opening night what are your thoughts how are you feeling I, you know i try i'm trying not to think about it i used to <laughs> the first day i used to read all the press i used to see like what are we doing you know let like check check the itunes charts every hour and see where we are um but now I don't, I don't want to do that because it, it, none of it feels healthy to me. Like, if somebody writes something bad, it hurts your feelings. If somebody writes something nice, you know, it it boosts your ego. And I feel like neither one, neither one seems particularly positive. Like I try to, I try to just be zen about it. Just like 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 tomorrow, I'm not going to go on the internet at all. I think I'm probably. I'm probably not even going to check anything tomorrow. Uh, I'm just going to let, I'm just going to let the world, I'm just going to let whoever wants to hear our record, listen to it or buy it. And, well, you, you know, you hope could, for the best. You could watch some baseball. Yeah, I could. I don't know what I'll do. It's opening, opening day today. There you go. Um, my, my, my son's been really getting into the planet of the apes. Maybe I'll watch another planet. There you go. Day. Yeah. Um, wish automatic suite. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've learned with you not to uh, prejudge from a title, just go with the damn title. Cause mm -hmm. it's, it's like a, it's like one of those uh, uh, magnet uh, uh, word piles that you put on your fridge and you make it. A, is, it is. It is kind of like that very much. So, so. But, but I, I'd be interested to know where this came from. 
the title? Well, no, the song itself. You know, th this one's interesting. Um, it might be hard to tell, but a, a lot of a lot of the almost all of the imagery in the song is like kind of fairground imagery. And I was thinking about the PNE, and I was thinking about being a kid and how the PNE was was such a fascinating place because it felt kind of grown up. Like when you're when you're ten when you're ten years old and you go there, there was something that felt a little dark and grown up about it. But even though it was something that was essentially for kids, and there was something that seemed, you know, it, 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 there was something that felt kind of magical, but it also felt super trashy. You mean? So I was so. Let me give you an example. Uh, first, first, there's many donuts. There's uh, there's uh, the barns. There's the bands that play there. Uh, the yeah. first time I ever saw and heard funk was the band above the entrance to the stripper tent mm -hmm. and there were four guys and they had done this show hundreds of times the trumpet player played with one no nobody was holding their instruments properly they were just playing basically going through the motions but the music was as funky as i'd ever heard i didn't mm -hmm. know what happened in the tent i just loved the band so mm -hmm. i had an epiphany at the at the peony yeah, like I, and I think for some reason it, it always, it, it always stayed with me. And when I was writing that song and I was writing lyrics, I realized like these lyrics, I, I kept coming back to this weird kind of theme of, of being at the fairground. So I thought, I thought maybe that would be, maybe, maybe, maybe that would be like the main theme of it. And then the very the very last the the coda the the outro the end of the song is about the mirror maze and it says meet me in the mirror maze tell me when you find the floor and i i like the metaphor of the mirror maze because i remember going into the mirror maze as a kid and thinking it's impossible to find your way out of the mirror maze <laughs> until one day i realized all you have to do is look at the floor and if you look at the if you just look at the floor and follow it it's the easiest thing in the world to get out of it so and and i think uh, I, I, it felt like a, it felt like a good message to, to end the album on. Like may, maybe you feel completely lost, but if you can find the floor, easy to find your way out. Uh, Carl, some songwriting questions. Uh, we're rapidly running out of time here. Um, songwriting questions. Uh, what's uh, what? What do you work best from uh, the riff or the words first? It's it's always. Um, it's always the music. It's always starts with the music, uh, okay. um, but it it uh it uh, it always takes weird new forms. Um, like I, I I usually have like the chords and the melody, and then I just start playing them, and then sometimes I go out just off on a tangent, um, just to see what works. Sometimes sometimes I have a line. Sometimes I have a line or like maybe a line with a melody attached to it and I build a song around that. But um, yeah, it usually it usually starts with like a chords and some right. melody and I just run with it. I just thought of a big overreaching question um, it, it, and I'm, I'm patting myself on the back for being so brilliant. Um, the life of the band, the life of the, the group of you through these nine albums, the band that you started out to be, mm -hmm. and the band that you've become. What was that? What's the journey been like? Um, I I don't know. Uh, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's it's always been the same process. Like, we'll start. I'll start writing a song, and then we sit down and we start going. What do we do with it? Because so much of our band has been the arrangement. So much of it, like we, we've, like when I show up with strumming my guitar on an acoustic, I think, well, that's that's not enough. Like, what else do we do with it? So there's there's just the game of throwing things at the song and going, what works? You know, should it be a ballad? Should we speed it up? Um, so that that element has been there from the beginning, and and it stay it stayed that way. But you know, it's where we do it. Uh, has changed uh, you know a few people have joined the band a few people have left the band um but it 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 very much feels it very much feels the same to me uh and and even when 
I'm trying to make a different kind of music, even when I'm trying to evolve musically or not trying to evolve, just naturally evolving, it it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like anything in our process is changing. It just feels like, you know, the music that I want to make is changing. And, and thank you for that. And and how much have we changed the audience? There's there maybe is a bigger question. Well, everybody's older. <laughs> it's a uh, which is which makes sense. But I mean, what do we want from our our live bands? What do we want? The music, as you said, when you first started, music's changing a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, for yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, I I've realized like yeah, some the audience sometimes will will go away and and new people will show up. Um, and I and I think that's just the way of things. Like I think of myself as a fan. Like sometimes I've been kind of fair weather. Sometimes I would be obsessed with the band for five years and then I'll just stop buying their music. Yes. You know, and sometimes I'll and to the point where I'm not even aware that they're still putting out records, you know, because I've I've gone on to like listen to other things. And I think if I'm like that, I can't I can't be insulted if somebody else, you know, I can't be insulted if somebody was really into us for a few years and then they started getting into something else because that's just the way the way things happen um and but but unfortunately i i don't have the luxury of going away i have to keep being me <laughs> um so i i you know it's, it's another one of those things i try not to think about you know i try to at at the heart of it, it it's a very simple process like i'm i'm trying to write songs that i think are good and play them in the way that i think is best and put them out there and hope people like them and I don't really know any more contrived way of doing it. I wish I did. I wish I wish I knew some contrived way to succeed and make millions of dollars because I would do it. I would do it in a second, but your, I do not know how to do it. It's your job. You're just doing your job. Yeah, exactly. I mean, who knows what you would have done if you stayed in Vancouver? You could have been laying, you could have been the best rebar layer in the world. You know, I think I'd probably, you know, I, I, I definitely embrace the path my life took, but I, I think I'd probably be a lot wealthier if I'd stayed in Vancouver. I'd probably have a couple of houses worth three million dollars. Uh, but I got I got my nice little house here. Yes, you do. It's okay. That's the that's the only thing that's the only thing I truly miss from Vancouver. That's no, that's not true. I miss I miss being able to cash in on the real estate craze, but no, <laughs> it was not it was not my path. It just wasn't my path. Uh, let me uh, uh, just a, a, an aside here. I'm I'm hoping that maybe you can uh, conjure something. Uh, this is a CKUA radio, which is listener supported, and it's been so. It's been donor supported for approaching a hundred years. It started at the University of Alberta, and then just kept going, and then it kept it became this great music station. Olga Peterson did it, still doing his blues show fifty five years later, or something like that, and I follow him. Um, and we're about to do our spring fundraiser, and I'm I'm hoping that uh, you, I can get you to comment on the value of a station like that, so that people who are considering uh, donating hear your words and and they they make a donation. Um, the value of a donor supported music station like this, CKUA, uh, province wide in Alberta. Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, donor-supported radio like CKUA, I think uh, it's been so essential to us. It's so essential to a, a lot of bands. Um, you know, like if you want, if if you want radio that that just plays music that they like, if you want radio that is not dictated by you know by money, uh, I think it, it, it's essential. It's it's. For for so many Canadian bands, I think it's been the foothold that is, you know, given given bands a, a chance at success. You, I I see it all across America. You know, like college and community stations. They're they're what's that's that's what's keeping a lot of independent music afloat. You know, that's what's helping to sell records and and tickets. And um, so yeah, I'm I'm all for it. Donate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now you're heading out on the road. Um, and I see one Canadian date, the Dan Ford. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no festival uh, uh, 
profile? I, I don't know. We'll we'll see. We 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 did a decent amount of Canadian festivals this last summer. Um, I don't know. I we'll see. Maybe maybe something will come up. Um, I just kind of go where I'm told. <laughs> my work, my my main work is done. You know, I I I did I did the record. Now I um. You know, so, so now 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 we pra- we practice, we get together and we practice and we go on the road, we get into our bus and play songs for people, and, which and, is kind kind and, of work. And, but and please remind the audience who walks out on stage with you, please. Uh, who's going to be with us on this tour? Well, no, um, I mean, the, the composition of the, of the pornographers who's coming out. Okay, well, yeah, it's me and Nico and Todd Fancy and John Collins and Joe Siders and Catherine Calder. And um, because because we have a lot of saxophone on this record, we're bringing along a, a friend to play saxophone, a guy by the name of Adam Schatz, who um, his main gig is he plays in Japanese Breakfast. You might have seen him on Saturday Night Live. Oh, that's um, great. So we're glad, we're glad that Adam, you know, we're we're glad that he decided to come slum it with us from the from the stages of Saturday Night Live uh, to the new pornographers. But yeah, um, I'm very psyched. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be very fun. Looking forward to it. And finally, I'll leave you with this one. One last is there one last album or project or or dream that you'd like to accomplish? Um, I don't know. You, you know, I think. I think I'm, I was thinking about this recently. I feel like I'm always chasing like, like the record that I should make, you yeah. know, like, it's like every everybody wants to paint their masterpiece, but I don't think, you know, I don't know if anybody ever thinks they get there. Like, I like, I wonder what it's like to be like Paul McCartney. Does Paul McCartney go, yeah, I've done it all. Like, I've got nothing to prove. And I was like, oh, I would love to be that guy. I, I would love to be that guy who's like, yep. I, I don't have anything to prove to you. I've I've written two hundred classics, you know. Um, <laughs> okay. But I think I think I will always there will always be a part of me that that has something to prove, and it's just to myself, you know. I think there will always be a part of me that makes a record and goes, "Well, that was good, but I think you can do better," you know. And I'll just start working on the next one, and I think that's going to be me until I basically die. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Don't die. Don't. don't, don't yeah, I will. I will. Just, well, yeah, we're, we're all going to live forever. We're all going to live forever, obviously. I know. Yeah. I know. Thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, nice talking thank to you. Thank you for your music, man. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you very much. And um, I'll see you down the road. If I can't, yes. I can't get to the Danforth. I'll keep watching those tour dates and see where you get. Yeah, it's a, it's a long ways away, isn't it? Thank you. All right, take it easy. Thank you.